So for this, I'm going to be moderating. I'm going to do my best to moderate this intense debate. But uh, <laughs> no, I think we all agree it was a very good PyCon, easily one of the best. But we're going to have uh, four guests. Uh, you know, if we can have uh, David and Mark and Robert Ansel, and of course, uh, you know, Guido Van Rossum, the uh, creator of the Python programming language, who is with here with us here tonight. Give them give all a round of applause. But you do have to come up here, though, so you can sit on the panel. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so we got, we, got, we got mics for you guys. Um, and I'll sit here. Yeah. So what color my my kids. You push it to talk, I think. I think red means muted. Okay. <laughs> Is it muted? Test, test. Test. Yeah, that's it. Okay, you have to push it. You have to All right. Push. Yeah. Everyone's mic right. working. We're good. Okay. So let's if if possible, let's just go down the line and get the correct pronunciations of each of your names. And uh, as well as, you know, tell us maybe like what sort of stuff you do and also how many PyCons have you been to? That's what I'm curious about. Where are you going to go left to right? Or my left to right? <laughs> yeah. So I'm Mark. Can you hear me? Is this working? Yes. This is no good? I can be louder. Should I just be louder? Wait for the green. Oh, push, push it? Yeah, push and wait. Push, push and wait. wait. Push and wait. Try so mighty. <laughs> Aren't you glad I touched Share it? his. <laughs> I, 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 I wish you the best we'll of luck with this. Oh, that was it. It just took that. It just took a little bit right. of time. Okay. <laughs> so my name's Mark, and as you can tell, I'm a co-organizer co of this meetup, which is why I know how all the AV equipment works. Um, no, thank you for hosting Box. Um, I also work on Twisted um, and uh, the TLS implementation in Python that used to be under cryptography. We moved it to its own organization in GitHub, um, and I, this was my third PyCon. Third PyCon. Very nice. Yeah, I have my own mic. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> a true professional. Mic. Thanks, Motion. Uh, I've been to all of them. <laughs> where, where, where Guido goes, Python, PyCon does follow. Yeah. I actually organized uh, a few of them. And before it was PyCon, there was something else too. There was the international was the international Python conference, and before that, we had a couple workshops. Wow. And so you've been to all of those too. Yes. <laughs> okay. Completionist. You achievement unlocked. And uh, let's see. And, and right now, what sort of stuff do you work on? Well, I work for Dropbox. Sorry, Box. <laughs> uh, okay. My main, main project is uh, working on MyPy, which is a static type checker for Python. Uh, there was a talk about that at PyCon, actually, although I didn't give it. And it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, you put annotations in your code, and the type checker treats it as if it is, is a statically typed program and gives you error messages that make sense. Very nice. And Robert? Uh, hi, Robert Ansel. Uh, I work at Box, and let's see, what? This is my third PyCon, and I have been generally working on mostly on the ops team, but I kind of bounce around as required. <laughs> um, but most. Typically, I'm sort of a handyman across ops and dev doing um, a lot of the automated provisioning, automated patching. Uh, anything automated is pretty much my job description at this point. So Python is a Swiss army knife that is very, very helpful Beautiful. <laughs> from day to day. And David? Hi, I'm Dave, and my microphone works, I guess. It does. Uh, so I'm on the desktop client side. I do something similar to Dropbox working on the client that syncs files. and. Uh, been at Box for five years, and I've been five years at PyCon, and five years in Python. So uh, before that, I was in C++, and now I just really enjoy programming in Python. It's really a, a lot of fun. Wonderful. So it's, it seems like we have you know, veterans across the board here in all respects, but a nice sort of uh, mix of different areas that you work on. So that uh, leads me to my next question, which is like, based on your expertise and experience, did you have a favorite talk from the conference, and what was it? Because if you don't know, all of PyCon's talks are online. So take notes. Uh, you know, these are going to be some of the best ones that you have out there. Once again, Mark. Just go down the line. Down okay. the line, once again. 
Feel free to discuss among yourselves. <laughs> so uh, a talk that I liked quite a bit um, was Itamar's talk on testing. Um, that was yours? OK, I can pick another one. Glyph, <laughs> Glyph had a talk on testing uh, that was also really good. Um, both of them talked about um, a, different approaches to thinking about testing. Um, a lot of the times you'll hear, you should write tests for your code, you should unit test your code, and then it kind of stops there. And it's difficult to come up with practical strategies to get useful tests out of your code. And both of these talks um, offered good perspectives, practical perspectives. And in the case of Itamar's talk, which you should talk more about, um, they, they, had, like, they offered a practical methodology for approaching your tests, um, which was very nice and very, I found very helpful. And so, how do you spell Ismar's name for those who are taking notes? Oh, geez. It's, it's I T A M A R. It's the first slide. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Guido, did you did you have a favorite talk? Did you go to many talks? I know a lot of people don't like to. They've seen it all. I know. I I think I saw most of the keynotes, and I saw the talk about MyPy by David and Yuka, and I saw a talk named Dial M from Mentor by one of my M mentees, Mariella, uh, about the value and importance of mentorship and how to choose a mentor and sort of how a mentor can help you over all sorts of mental blockages that make you think you're not capable of participating in this community. Definitely. I mean, uh, I've, heard that, I've heard senior engineers say that the most important output of senior engineers is more senior engineers. <laughs> so, so mentorship is really key to that. Would, so you recommend the talk about mentorship then? Yes. Nice. Robert, I hope I stalled long enough for you to come up with another, <laughs> another talk that is your favorite. So I'm, I'm just going to go a little bit more into sort of the subject matter of the, the testing talk that I was uh, referring to. Basically, the, everybody knows about unit and integration testing. That's sort of the step one of how to have testable code. Uh, but then if you want to level up past that, then you start getting into things like fuzzing, uh, mutation testing, uh, property-based testing. Uh, so basically, you're, you're able to do much more in-depth tests than you would ever imagine. You know, nobody thought about doing Chaos Monkey, because why would you? It's a terrible idea. Uh, but you know, mutation testing does just that. It's, we're going to tweak your code and see what breaks. And if you, your unit tests didn't catch that we just changed your code, there's something wrong with your unit tests. Um, so th th it's sort of just the mechanism by which you can go much further with your testing architecture and catch things that are beyond the, the traditional, oh, somebody had a typo, and they they missed something. It's, you can actually check the health of your testing infrastructure. Very nice. And um, so there's always a couple of speakers at PyCon that are always entertaining. So I try to make sure I go to their talks. Uh, David Beasley. Um, nice. I go to uh, Raymond Hedger. Always does a good talk. Um, and uh, Brandon Rhodes always good. So I made sure I caught all those guys. I, of course, caught everybody on the panel here. You know, Guido and Moshe. Um, but I think uh, Larry Hastings' stuff on the galectomy was what I was looking forward to because I wanted to see the progress on it. And he, uh, like he said, everybody, everybody who walks up to him says, hey, how's the galectomy going? So that was the name of his talk. So he says, you don't need to ask that question anymore. Uh, and it was uh, really interesting because I know he'd been working really, really hard on it, and I wanted to see what had been going on. And uh, it also echoes a lot of my own experiences with performance optimizations and that it can be incredibly frustrating where you're like, ah, oh, this is it. This is going to really win. And then you try it out, and it gets worse. <laughs> <coughs> and you're like, well, I don't want to throw away this work. I'll just put it aside and then branch. And maybe it, I'll be able to bring it back in when I learn something else. Uh, and that's what a lot of his talk was about, sort of the trials and tribulations of, of removing the gill and how um, it starts off really easy. And then you, know, you, you, you test stuff, and it's just not getting any faster. But he, it was really amazing, the, the progress that he's made. He's a really smart guy. And, Lots of people have been helping him out with ideas and stuff like that. So that was really interesting. And, and so the prognosis is mostly good? Well, yeah. I, well, I don't want to ruin the ending That's of his yeah, talk. Yeah. <laughs> you got to go watch it for yourself. Uh, but to start off, you know, he started, it, the idea is to remove the gill and then still have single threaded programs run as fast as they do today with, the, with uh, no gill, with, with the gill, you know, without the gill in the same speed. And um, so putting in locks and all the shared stuff. And then running it and finding out it's 20 times slower. And then trying to get, go from there to trying to get one to one. 
And so, like, has anyone placed any bets that you know of, Guido, like, you know, as to whether or not this will be a grand success? Well, I'm not holding my breath yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it may happen, it may not happen. Mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely regardless of how well he manages to to sort of keep it backwards compatible, it's, it's going to be at least 5 and 4.0, if not 5.0. You heard it here, anyway, folks. 4.0. <laughs> Get excited. <laughs> we, should no. call it, we should call it 40,000. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Warhammer. Uh, <who? laughs> but, uh, but sort of in that, in that vein of language advancement and so forth, a, a lot of people who, uh, you know, don't know a lot about PyCon, like prior to PyCon and after PyCon, there are a lot of activities as well. And I'm sort of curious about one in particular, the, the language summit that was, you know, before, that is before every PyCon, I think. Uh, how did that go this year? It went very well. Uh, that's where I learned the outcome of Larry's galactomy talk. You get a preview. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he did, he did like a 10, 15 minute uh, summary version. Uh, I, I can't actually sort of recall individual sessions from Language Summit, but there is, there was a journalist present from Linux. Uh, LWS? I think so, yeah. yeah. And he wrote up very detailed summaries. Yes. And so th those, and, and I'm, I am totally blanking out on his name. I think it was Jake something. Jake Edge? What was it? Jake Edge. Jake Edge. Yeah. Jake Edge? All right, that's a cool name. Uh, but yeah, no, definitely. If, if you're interested in like sort of technology journalism, I actually highly recommend checking out LWN.net. It's one of the oldest names in the biz, and it's got uh, a really, really fantastic journalistic approach compared to, I don't know. It's not just Linux either. As you could think, they're talking about Python. So just sure. because it's Linux Weekly News, if you're not into that, there's going to be something you like. Right. No, and even though it's a subscription model, after a week, the articles actually uh, become free to read. I, I actually like their model a lot, and I recommend supporting them if you got the salary, which I think a lot of you do. So, uh, <laughs> well, that's good to hear that Language Summit is going well. Um, did anyone stay for the sprints afterwards? One day. One day. Wow, one day is popular, it seems. Uh, n n not you guys? Yeah, stuck around for a day, but that was about it. Yet another day. Okay, so between. Can we go for four? Uh, this time I didn't because we had a shipping thing gotcha. going on, so there was a real crunch time here. So, but, but, so I, otherwise, I would have stayed. But, but you know, so each of you stayed for three quarters of a day on average. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, any interesting developments there? I can't turn my mic. On. Somebody else. Stop shoot. turning no, off no, the mic, it. Mark. <laughs> Somebody else go. You go. I made no meaningful contributions, so. Mm -hmm. My my uh, merge my pull request was uh, rejected. Rejected. It was what rough. Pro what project? Uh, it was on uh, one of it was basically an Apache integration mm. for for with Python. It was yeah, they, yeah. What was what was the what was the experience? Were you a new developer for that project? Yeah, I'd never touched it before. I never heard of it before. I just sort of showed up to one of the sprints. And mm -hmm. What was what was the onboarding experience like? Because I know sometimes that can be not good or it can be really really good. I'm. Not gonna go into that. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. No. It, 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 it was positive. rough for me mm -hmm. for reasons that were outside of the original developer's control. It's often the case. Yeah. I mean, everybody like uh, having a everybody's development environment's a little different. So, yeah. but there 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 are definitely things you can do, mm -hmm. and we we did a MyPy sprint, and a couple of uh, the Dropbox MyPy team stayed for at least three days, mm -hmm. uh, and so we did the same thing last year. Last year, we were not sufficiently prepared, and we had a lot of people show up who didn't have sufficient sort of basic knowledge to be effective, and, and it was, was like, we got a few good contributions out of it, but sort of not that much. And this year, we sort of, having learned from that experience and also from a smaller sprint that was uh, over weekend in San Francisco, somewhere in March, that I didn't personally attend. Uh, we learned to sort of prepare projects and sort of vet the, the people who come to the project a bit 
And we were much more successful in getting people to sort of come up with reasonable projects and uh, submit pull requests that were accepted or that are, are about accepted. But the sort of, the, ch the champion of all that is the Zulip project. Yeah. It's an open source <laughs> chat uh, system. And they, they, have, they have an amazing onboarding they, experience. I think they had 27 people show up for their sprint. Yeah, it's, it's like basically a Slack or HipChat competitor that's open source. Um, written in Python. Written in Python, absolutely. Uh, the good portion of their team worked at Dropbox for a while. Um, it maybe still do, but basically I was amazed, right? They were like newbies, first PyCon ever, and somehow they'd heard of this thing that I hadn't heard of a year ago. You know, and they were excited to work on the sprint. I don't know exactly what made that work, but they've certainly unlocked some secrets there. So speaking of advice, well, Mark, did you work on the project you want to talk about? Well, I, I have some, I'd like to, it's difficult to onboard new developers in general, and it's interesting to hear uh, if, like, so it sounds like a practical piece of advice that we can learn from the MyPy experiences. If you're gonna bring new developers in, you should have defined projects that are appropriate for people who aren't super familiar with the project. There are other pieces of advice. Um, I, I mean, I was part of the Twisted Sprint, so as you can imagine, it's, we also had some issues bringing new developers on. Um, so I'd be interested to hear more if there's any other pieces of practical advice that you might have for, for bringing new people on board. Well, my, my own advice would also be try to, try to approach, the, try to sort of reach out to people that you think might be good contributors rather than just sitting there with a sign out front that says open to all who come. Okay. Uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're sort of, I mean, that is what, the Zul what the Tim Abbott from Zulip did very well. Mm -hmm. He put the word out before PyCon and mm -hmm. during PyCon. Okay. Uh, and so people were excited about the project and had, had the uh, opportunity to read up on it a bit. And, and sort of finding, you, you have to reach out to people that's more effective than, than, than just sort of saying net. every, yeah, <laughs> if you cast too wide a net, you'll get. David, did you have uh, something to add? I was gonna say, it seemed like for me when I did sprints, I was there for a four day sprint and it's best if it's that the groups think of it as almost like a recruiting opportunity and mm -hmm. not sort of like a goal to get a lot of patches done or bugs fixed but get people up to speed on the code and that they will be contributing in the future. Right. Um, I did a, I sat in with uh, Twisted a bit and I sat in with uh, the CPython group and CPython group worked out better than Twisted, apologies. <laughs> um, it's fair. But I was able to get a number of patches done for CPython, but that was, they, they really helped handhold me through setting up my development environment, getting everything set up. Uh, I was building on Windows, which a lot of people don't use, uh, but really walk through a lot of that stuff. And the, the, mostly the goal was to get me to be able to contribute in the future. Mm -hmm. And say like, you know, you're, you're Windows guy, we need Windows guys in the future, so we're gonna spend some time working with you so that gets you up to speed. And uh, yeah, I mean, you forgot the most important like, you know, tip, Mark, you could start a meetup and invite people to you and onboard them on your projects then. It's so like, you know, for a little bit of foreshadowing, we are planning on having a project night uh, in the near future. And so you can try out some of these tips then. Uh, my tip is write the docs before the sprint. Uh, so anyways, um, well, you know, we're sort of, it's a short panel. Uh, you know, I was kind of wondering, is there something, as a short answer, like, you know, that you'd like to see in next year's PyCon in Cleveland, aside from more shining faces from the audience out there? I'm going to start from that end now. Sure, I've got something already in mind. Okay. Um, so I organized uh, the code contests for Box at uh, each of the PyCons. So you know we have uh, prizes and ask people to, to code stuff. Um, and I always do all the coding contests that are there. But what I would like to, at PyCon, at least on the website, is a collection or a, a directory of who's got code contests. Hmm. Because as it is, you have to kind of like crawl around the, uh, the area to try to talk to everybody, and then it's just through the rumor mill, you know, that somebody will say, oh, LinkedIn has got a contest. That's really cool, so or so-and-so. So, -and -so. so these are coding contests that are run by the, uh, the companies that you're there representing, not like, because there was, I think, a boff, or rather like an open session that was a tournament. There was like some coding tournament that was happening just at PyCon. It wasn't related to any outside companies. 
Yeah, no, uh, well, so I don't know about the, the coding term. It wasn't on, on the website. So it, 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 was in the, like it was in the Birds of Feather Open Sessions board. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I hosted stuff on the open sessions. That may be the one that you saw. Oh, maybe. Okay. Um, so yeah, because I would I would host a number of rooms where people could come and work on on the contest. Gotcha. Uh, and that's one of the things I I learned after the second or third PyCon is that people want some help on the coding contests. So we would help people with any of the coding contests. Just come on in, and we'll help coach you, and you can learn more Python, and then submit and get your T-shirt or whatever the prizes are. There. And it's not <laughs> cheating. That's within the rules. Yeah, there's nothing that says, right, yeah, that's not Just cheating. checking, just checking, yeah. okay. I mean, we're not going to write the code for them. We're, you know, they say, like, here, you might want to use a list for this. Or sure, nudge, that. nudge, wink, wink, all right. Uh, nice pro tips, pro tips, that's all. <laughs> pro tips, okay. All right, any, any other additions, uh, you know, for next year, maybe? I mean, I think in that same vein, um, what I was actually thinking of was helping out people with coding contests uh, opened me up to the idea of having things like, open office hours effectively, saying you have an expert, like, you know, at PyCon, you are f it's full of experts on a ton of different topics, and if you have people that are interested in just spreading more knowledge in a subject matter that they are, have interest or a focus in, being able to say, um, we have an expert in uh, multi-threaded design, like systems design, something like that, and having an op open spaces that are dedicated to people coming in and saying, I have this weird project, this weird problem I'm fiddling with, mm -hmm. do you have any ideas, or directions I could run with this, things like that. That's interesting. Yeah, I actually. Really good ideas. Yeah, I, I ran five different open sessions this time about plugins <laughs> and logging and uh, reliability and uh, even there was one about podcasts that I was there. Uh, <laughs> so, anyways, um, yeah, I'm a big fan of the open sessions and that one sounds really interesting in particular. You should come and run it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. All right. How about you, Guido? You've seen it all after all these years, right? Is there anything you miss from the days past, or anything that you see going forward? Well, it, it's, it's so big. The, the, the first Python workshop, there were 20 people. Uh -huh. and, and a few years later, there were two or 300 people. And for the longest time, we had one track. And it was so nice, because I could go to all the talks. And now I go to none of the talks, because I, I get stuck in the hallways. <laughs> <laughs> we need, we need, my, we need my, a Guido mobile to transport my, you between the They talk about no, the my, hallway my, track, and that's a valuable track. It, it the is, hallway it track. It's a viable track, but it's the only track I end up uh, participating <laughs> in. My, my personal wish is actually cardboard cutout of myself so people can take <laughs> selfies without taking my time. That, that can be done, I think. You can probably, yeah, that's a pretty simple request. Cleveland can make it happen. How about you, Mark? I like this idea with more organization. I think having uh, like around if, if there's a oh, office hours that could be publicized before they're set up. On the one hand, it's really great to have the dynamicism of the BOF board. So if you haven't been to PyCon, uh, every morning of the conference, uh, there's a big board with hours uh, going down and then rooms going across. And you put up, if you want to have an open space um, to talk about something, uh, it can be anything. There was a knot tying one. There's one on podcasts. There was one on asynchronous programming in Python. You write your information down on a piece of, on a, like a three by five card and put it in the slot. So this is really cool because you kind of walk in and see what's available, maybe post your own. But it would be great if there, if, if like you knew ahead of time, like we're definitely going to have an async buff, which yeah. is known if you're, if you're part of that community, it's well known that's going to happen. Would it be nice to see some greater organization around it to, for planning, if All that's right. possible? Definitely. Well, let's see. Any tweetable advice for people out there for next year's PyCon as a very last question? From anyone, not everyone. Go. Go. All right. So we have one vote for go. <laughs> Register early and book your hotel early because those things get full. And I'll actually second that. So basically, like, if you know you're going, Right? Get your hotel like immediately. The hotel is what ran out like soonest in, in yeah. my book, right? Like just get the hotel room. Because the thing is you can cancel a hotel reservation. It's harder to cancel your ticket and it's harder to cancel your airline ticket, but the hotel reservation is really easy to cancel. So definitely get your hotel early. Uh, sorry, I don't have better Python advice for you, but we'll be around tonight and uh, we can continue this then. But in the meantime, thank you guys for a great set of answers. Uh, let's give a round of applause. All right, and now uh, we actually have a 10-minute, like you know, sort of intermission. If you have announcements or uh, you know you're hiring, uh, I'd like to see you come up, and you guys are free to go.
<laughs> Thank you for your service. <laughs> But you're also free to stay. You don't have to go all the way. You're free to stay, enjoy the food in the back, and so forth. But yeah, uh, so who's hiring? Let's hear it. It's summer. The job market's hot. Everything's hot. Yeah, you can come get set up, yeah. Here you go, Moshe. Uh, yeah, so uh, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're hiring. Um, I. I have no idea what the job descriptions are, but uh, Moshe at shopkick.com. It's pretty easy. My name, shopkick and .com. Uh, if you're a Python programmer, we probably want to hear from you. Um, I don't know. Anyone else hiring? Looks like Box is hiring. Is the there are many signs uh, indicating that Box is hiring. Yes. They're very uh, fresh. This is, this is up to date information. Yes. <laughs> uh, Denise at box.com. <laughs> exactly the way you expect me to and, and you know how um, to get here is the important part, right? The commute is yeah. not so bad. You, you already proved you know how to commute. Um, yeah. Your name? Uh, so my name is Sean and I'm Cameron. And uh, so we work for a small startup in Mountain View called Simple Legal. Um, we're a Django shop, so anyone who you know likes Python, likes Django, you know, come talk to us. Hey, even if you hate Django, come talk to us. I'd love to talk to you. So, um, but tell us why it's not good. We'd like to maybe change your mind. So, <laughs> it's always good. Um, so yeah, um, you can look at our uh, jobs at uh, career uh, simplelegal.com slash careers, and we're hiring uh, full stack, back end, front end. If you like to. Anyone who can write Python. Program JavaScript. We can do it. Anyone? Anyone. Thank you. All right. Well, you know, for those of you who haven't built up the courage yet, there will be another slot after Roy here. But it looks like he's ready to go. Um, Michael, if we can get this other projector up here, uh, that would be great for people over here to see a little bit more easily. But otherwise, yeah, let's give it up for Roy. Is this any better? <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So, by show of hands, who here has heard of Pilot? Okay, like most of the people here. Who here uses Pilot? More than I would expect. Cool. Um, so today we're going to be diving into Pilot, how you should use Pilot, uh, and kind of what, set, what sets Pilot apart from some of the other things in the ecosystem. Um, so we're talking about why you should be using linters as a whole. Uh, we're talking about what differentiates Pilot from some of the other linters. We're going to dive into the internals of Pilot. Uh, and kind of some of the secret sauce that makes it maybe a little bit more robust. And then we have time for questions and answers. Sound good? Cool. Uh, so before we jump in, who am I? Uh, my name is Roy Williams. Uh, I'm an engineer at Lyft. Uh, I focus on a team called Core Libraries where we effectively own the Python stack at Lyft. Um, a big part of this has been our Python 3 migration, and this is how I came to be a contributor to PyLint. Um, most of the recent contributions, the PyLint uh, fixers, have, or PyLint checkers, have come from Lyft. Um, so we generally, as we port code over, if there is anything that we think static analysis should have found before we caught later down the line, we try to implement a linter for it, or better yet, an automatic fixer for it. Uh, my email is rwilliams at lift.com if you want to get in touch. Um, but f before we get into Pilot, I want to get into why, why we should use linters in general. Um, you've heard all the, the normal stuff, to find bugs automatically, to enforce inconsistent code style across the code base, blah, 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 and like, that, I mean, and, and there's some merit to this kind of stuff. As, as an example, uh, take a look at this code here, and what do you think this code will print? You don't need to shout it out, but just kind of, kind of think. Um, you kind of have a general idea of what you think it prints out? Okay, what about now? Is it any clearer? Maybe, maybe a little bit clearer? Um, so it turns out there's actually a lot of good science behind this. University of Indiana did a study where they uh, put code in front of people that was using a variety of different code styles, and it turns out the latter example, people got wrong 20% more. Uh, and so if you go back and look at that example, it only has one space indent, it has this big gap between the count is and done counting, and so if you're glossing over some code, you can see how you can really easily misinterpret what this code does. Uh, and so without a doubt, there's a ton of value in that aspect of this. Um, but for me, code re the, the, the real value of linters is up-leveling your code review. Uh, who here has ever done a code review of maybe an unfamiliar piece of code 
or you ask someone to review some code who isn't familiar with what you're working on, and the first thing they revert to is being a pep-8 init. Um, it just, it turns out that doesn't add a lot of value. Uh, like, linters are really good at catching this. And so if you lean on linters, they can do all of that work for you, forcing your code reviewers to focus on the value add, to make sure they understand the code, making sure they um, are actually catching bugs. Uh, and in fact, this can sometimes lead to blindness. Who, has anyone here seen uh, Remy Hedinger's talk, Beyond Pep 8? A few people? Okay, so for those of you who haven't seen this talk, uh, but this, you should go and watch this talk. He's a way better speaker than I am. Um, but the, the crux of it is that while Pep 8 is a useful tool, it should not be kind of seen as a religion that you must enforce. Uh, and one of the examples that he gives is this video right here. Oh, before I get started with this video, what I want you to do is you're gonna, there's going to be people in white shirts and black shirts. And I want you to count how many times someone in a white shirt catches the ball. Okay, got it? For the sake of speed, let's speed this up. Okay. Let's go. Okay, there's one. There's another. There's a dribble. They passed again. Another pass, another pass. Another pass. Another over the shoulder. Yep, there's a pass. Uh, another one. And for those of you who are laughing, uh, so for those of you who weren't laughing, maybe you, you, you missed what was going on here. Um, the whole point of this is that a gorilla walks through the screen midway through, pounds his chest, and then walks, walks us out of the frame. Uh, and if all you are focused on is style mitts, that is you in code review. All you are focused on is how many spaces and whether or not there is a proper doctrine here, and you're not catching the real issues in your code. Um, and it turns out there's actually good, good science here as well. Uh, Microsoft did some studies where they looked at the value of code review. The first question they asked people is, what value do you see in code review? Uh, number one answer is finding defects, then code improvements, alternate solutions, knowledge transfer, all, all of this good stuff. Like, and, and probably the reasons why you do code review at your companies. Um, but when it turns out when they looked at what kind of comments were addressed in code review, uh, the vast majority were code improvements or understanding or social communication. Uh, defects was four. Um, and no, this isn't totally unreasonable, right? Like it's way more valuable to catch a defect in code review time. So it's not totally unreasonable, but it is not the expectations for what people have for why you do code review. Uh, similarly, th then they asked people what level of understanding they feel is required to address these different issues. Finding defects and alternate solutions, they felt required the most understanding of, a, of an underlying system. Um, so if you take nothing else from this talk, think about linters as tools that force, your en that force engineers and your teams to be on these top two levels of understanding the code and not just being a style knit. Because I can go look at any code base and knit the shit out of it with, auto, with Pep8, but auto pep is really good at that, so why, why should I waste my time on it? Cool, so let's get into how Pylint plays into this. So how is Pylint different than some of the other lenders here? Uh, so imagine that we have a matrix of all of the possible um, properties that a, that a linter could have. Um, so the ideal linter would, of course, find all of the issues and have zero false, false positives. Um, and of course, that'd be great, but we, we can never get there. Flakegate tends to bias more towards having zero false positives at the cost of finding less issues. Pylint tends to be in the other quadrant. It will find more issues, but you have to deal with more false positives. Um, and we can talk some about how to make this trade-off work for you. Uh, and so Pylint isn't all you know, sunshine and rainbows. The, the most common complaint about Pylint is that you have a reasonably working code base, you point Pylint at it, and it gives you a score of two out of 10 and finds 10,000 issues. And you know, your spidey senses start tingling, you start thinking, well, like, this code actually works and runs in production, there's probably not 10,000 things wrong with it. Um, and so generally people here just like, kind of bail on Pylint. Um, but hopefully we can show you how to, how to get more value out of it. Cool, so let's hop into a quick demo of Pylint. Um, so I have, of course, my contrived example here. Um, so we import some things. We have a function that always returns false. Uh, we have a function here that, that clearly has some things wrong with it. My ID is highlighting some things, not others. Uh, we implement what I think is a context manager. I'm not too sure, though. Um, and then I have a function that, um, uh, that, return, that, that uses the new type annotation stuff that Guido was talking about. So cool, let's, let's see what Pylint, or what, say, Flakegate says about this code. So flagged a couple issues. It flagged that the OS import isn't used, but it also flagged that the typing list import isn't used, which, which isn't true. It's used in the type annotation down here. Um, so that's a little fr frustrating. And also flagged that this value here, ex executed, isn't used. Um, cool, so it found you know, two real issues with my code, one not so real issue with my code. 
Um, so let's take a look what PyLint says. So PyLint says my code is garbage. It said a whole bunch of stuff here. I don't have any doc strings here because I'm a bad person. I'm redefining variables. It, it's just a mess. Um, so So one of the first tips I have for using PyLint is start with the most valuable uh, error messages. So right now we're going to suppress um, any refactoring, any comments, or any warnings. Oh, cool. So we have one error with our code that PyLint has flagged. So it's flagged that I've implemented the exit method of this context manager incorrectly, which is correct. I need the, uh, I can't remember the off the top of my head, the other two parameters to properly implement the exit function here. Now, this is something that Flakegate will not flag. Flakegate thinks, well, maybe you do mean to have a dunder exit method. Uh, I don't know. It could be. Um, and so because it's legit, Python says, sure. Um, Pilot will, will actively warn about this. Uh, so let's, let's imagine we fix that and go look at some of the warnings as well. Um, so Pilot is, is catching that we are re redefining some variables, variables foo, um, which we have the variable here foo, and we are defining the method foo. So this foo is shadowing this foo. Um, we have uh, a conditional statement with a constant value, which is super useful. Um, so here I have always false, but I, I'm just referring to the function definition, which will always be truthy, right? It is always not null. So this will always evaluate, which will always evaluate the true, which is almost always a bug. Um, and again, something Python is willing to flag, but it's valid Python code, so Flakegate won't flag it. Um, we have a warning about unreachable code. Uh, this code here is clearly unreachable because we raise, a, we raise an exception. Um, the, the error message about uh, the exit. But one thing you'll, you'll notice here is that it does not warn me about the list import. Pilot knows that the, that the, um, the, the, list, the list method is in fact used here. <coughs> um, and now switching gears a little bit, one of the, the other most useful features about Pilot has been the Python 3 support. Um, which is where I spend most of my, which is where I make most of my contributions. So one second. Okay, does anyone know what's wrong with this code for Python 3? Ah, that's fine. Um, that's why we have linters, right? We don't, I don't want you to be automatic human linters. Um, so PyLint has flagged that the string module uh, no longer has the method lower on it. Um, interestingly, I do something bad like this and replace the symbol string with just an empty string, I no longer get any warnings. So, so Pilot has symbolically understood my code here, which is pretty interesting. So let's get into how this works. Um, so just, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about how PyLint itself works. It is a, what you'd expect from most linters. You parse some stuff out of an AST, you implement a visitor pattern. It's great. Go look at the code. Uh, where most of the magic happens, though, is in a module called Asteroid. Asteroid is a wrapper around the AST module, works for both Python 2 and Python 3. and <coughs> um, has some really interesting properties about it. So just kind of out of the gate, we have some function print foo. We can get the node. We can get the AST for the node kind of what you would expect if you've ever worked on a static analysis tool. But where Asteroid starts getting really interested is when it comes to inference. Um, oh, and so just to quickly talk about this code here, uh, we, there's a method extract node. It has the magic comment uh, hash at that will specify that's the node it is extracting, and so just a, a useful uh, helper method. Um, so say we have this code here, x equals 3, y equals 5. Uh, so we, the, the node x plus z is a binary operation uh, with the left of x, right of z, uh, and it can't infer anything about this because it has no idea what z is. Um, but let's change this to x to y. So interestingly, it knows the statement x plus y is a constant, and it knows the value of that statement is 8. Um, pretty, pretty interesting. It's actually like done some amount of symbolic ex execution to figure this out. Uh, similarly, here's the uh, example for what we were looking at before um, with the string module. So we import string, we call string.lower, uh, and we get the, um, the, we infer what the type of the expression is. Uh, and, and we get a module, it is in fact the string module, the built-in string module, yeah. Sure. 
So we get the built-in string module here. Um, cool. But if I then shadow string, the receiver, the left-hand side is now a constant string. Um, and let's see what the limits of this symbolic ex execution is. So now we have a, a class A um, that implements the add method by adding the other's bar field plus my foo divided by two. Um, and th th this code returns 45 if you execute, if you add together A and B. Um, interestingly, if we ask Asteroid what the type of A plus B is, it knows it is the constant 45. So the symbolic execution here is actually fairly rich and fairly deep. Um, and kind of one last quick thing to go over here uh, for the type annotations, uh, Asteroid useful, uh, very usefully has a annotation field that you can get to. <coughs> um, so I've declared A uh, as a list of sets of integers, uh, very, very complicated stuff here. Um, and I can get out the annotation from that as well, which we can then use in Pylon to implement future checkers. Uh, pretty, pretty cool stuff. Cool. So back to the slides. Um, so how to effectively use Pylint? Uh, start with warnings, then start with errors, then turn on warnings. Uh, if you start with the everything on, you're just you're going to have a bad time. Um, but we this isn't anything we're doing yet, but something that we want to start doing in the future is split apart the mandatory rules from the suggestions. Um, <coughs> and we want to surface the, the suggestions at code review time, uh, have them comment on existing code, but don't actually enforce them. And so, you know, Pylint will notice like, hey, your method's getting kind of big. Uh, you may want to think about refactoring it, which is a comment that a code reviewer may make, um, but it's nothing that you necessarily want to enforce, right? You want to enable people to ignore these things if they really choose to do so. Uh, as an example, Lyft, as a plug for something we open source at Lyft, uh, we have a tool called Linty Fresh, whose only job in life is to turn Lint errors into GitHub comments. Um, and this is super effective with that idea of what we talked about, of having the robots handle all of kind of the nits uh, and having humans handle all the important stuff. Uh, cool. So with that, I think we were right on 15 minutes. Do we have any time for questions? Cool. Yeah. 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 So good question. So the question was, uh, if during symbolic execution, uh, for whatever reason it bails, uh, how does that report that? So this code up here. <coughs> Uh, is the example, uh, you call infer, which returns a generator of the possible types that it, that it could be. Uh, if it can, nothing can be inferred, it throws a name inference error. Um, so in, in this case here, we, that's when we just print out could not infer. So if I change this to Z, it prints out could not infer instead of you know, a node with the value of eight. Cool. Any Crystal other questions? Thing. Yeah. Yeah, we got one. Yeah, so the question was, is there an auto fix setting for Pylint? Uh, unfortunately not. This is something that some of the newer static analysis tools are starting to put in, like error prone from Google, which is a Java static analysis tool, uh, has the option to implement a fixer for every issue. Uh, generally, again, we, we mostly do this in the context of Python reporting. We try to use uh, Python modernize to catch most of the things, so then we have both the verification and the fixer built in. But frankly, two to three doesn't have as nice of an API as Pylint does, doesn't do the same amount of inference, so it can't catch all of the issues. Yeah, good question. Great. Asher? Hey, um, do any of these tools give some measure of type safety at function interfaces? So like there are various schemes of putting decorators on functions to try to get some type safety. Could these tools um, eliminate the need for such checking? Uh, so the, in, in terms of like surfacing the type safety, uh, yes, one of the things that I actually Lyft contributed to MyPy is that you can have MyPy dump out Cobra XML which like any other code coverage tool can read in. And so you can use this to get a sense for how covered your code is with, with types. Um, in terms of does this replace the type annotations, uh, there, there are like big limits to the inference engine. Like the, of course, because this is a talk, the demo that I gave here is like pretty much as far as the inference engine goes. Um, so it, it, like I, I am starting to explore how we can start to marry the two. Like can we get from Asteroid 
some of the types that can currently be inferred to kind of bootstrap type information. Um, but this is still something that's very exploratory. Great. Cool. Yeah. Alrighty. Great job, Roy. Come find me afterwards if you have any other questions. Definitely. Yeah, pilots. I mean, I w what I want to see is what that pilot RC looks like in your real projects. Uh, I don't know. I just added one to mine, and it's pretty long. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that the pilot team wants to work on. Is there's been talk of like having different levels for your code, and you can like start off with like level zero, and then you fix all the errors and go to level one. So it's going to be something we will likely bake into pilot itself, mm -hmm. so that you don't have these like here are the best practices for like pilot RC files. Like for example. I think cyclomatic complexity is usually a bullshit metric because all that happens is whoever trips over it is like, well, shit, now we've got to extract something into a method. Right. You've added zero value. You've made the code more complicated. Okay. Um, but I mean, that's anyway, a strong opinion. About? I'm sure you can find some d dissenters out there. But no, <laughs> very, very good, very good. All right. So do we have any more uh, like sort of announcements, hirings, uh, lightning talks, spur of the moment? Lyft is hiring. Roy wants his referral bonus. Everyone use rwilliams at lyft.com when you join Lyft as a driver. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, my name is Casey. Um, I work at Box. I just wanted to welcome all you guys here. Thank you, thank you for coming. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, thanks to all our speakers. Um, if you're interested in working on Python, working at Box, uh, let us know, come talk to me. Um, we have ops, dev, um, a lot of different teams. Everybody's using Python, so if you think that interests you, yeah, talk to me or Denise. Thank you. Anybody else that have announcements? Looking for a job? Yeah, come up, talk. Great. I feel silly having the notes, but talking about myself is one of my hardest things. Uh, so short version is help desk in IT, then tech support for basically ops folks, then QA and well ops and dev support at a DNS management company, or rather a company that wrote DNS servers and software to manage them. Then QA and then dev at an e-commerce company doing well, similar to the previous as well as actual dev work. Um, I ended up getting a reputation for the person you would go to if you wanted somebody to really dig in and do like a half day full dive into your code pull, or pull request and find everything I could come up with about it. hopefully not the stuff the pilot would catch, but also <laughs> the you know trying to understand what you're trying to accomplish there, figure out if it makes sense, figure out ways of making it more obvious to the humans, that type of thing. And I also got sort of a reputation for if you need some random tidbit of information, well, go ask Nick. He may not know the answer, but he'll probably know who or where to find the info from. Um, so I am definitely looking for preferably a dev position or DevOps. Hanging out at the table over there, I'll talk to you in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, wherever our last presenter went to, I'll be talking with him too. Uh, I think Box has already got my resume and thank yeah. you. Green shirt, Nick, for all your dev and DevOps needs. Very good. Nick Colson, that sounds familiar. All right. Yeah, we got another one, all right. I'll jog over my trip and get a nice settlement from Box. Thanks. Hey guys, uh, my name's Mike. Uh, I've, uh, I've mostly been in the startup scene uh, doing Django sort of web app stuff, and I'm looking for a job, so uh, come talk to me. Simple legal was up there last time. I don't know if you caught that. They're looking for Django spots. All right. Yeah. Very good, very good. Yeah? Hey, how's it going? YouTube? YouTube hiring? YouTube is hiring? <laughs> uh, well, Google's always hiring, so if you guys want to talk to anybody from Google, I'm here and happy to talk to you about it. Yeah, Aaron too. All right. <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. Okay. Okay. Well, 
In that case, Moshe, are you, are you sufficiently mic'd? Are you ready to go? This is going to be a demo-based talk, I have heard. It needs to be green. Okay. Yoo-hoo! Woo. All right. You see the excitement. Um, Get excited for Moshe. A round of applause, please. Yep. So uh, I didn't prepare any slides. I thought uh, it'll be more fun to just uh, go do my entire. Um, oppa, oh, that's so fun. Yeah, exciting, right? Um, yeah, so I, I thought I'll just do my entire talk as a live programming demo. We'll see how it works. If you see anything I'm doing wrong, feel free to shout out what I'm doing wrong. It'll be fun. So I want to talk to you about talks. Um, so talks is a tool to run your tests and your linters, right? You saw Roy had to run lint with like all kinds of magical arguments that you probably want to keep somewhere to know which magical arguments to, to run it with. Um, and you want to make sure that it always runs it in the same environment and with uh, the same dependencies. And you might want to check several different dependencies because you might be working from moving from one version of the library to the other. Talks helps you with all of that. And we will see a little bit on how to use talks today. Um, so basically, I see talks as something that helps you make your code better. Uh, it doesn't help you make your code more useful. So um, I started with the most useful code I can do that. Uh, and the way to do that is, of course, um, to call your code useful, right? That's clearly, it's all in the name. Um, yeah. Uh, and let's just start with uh, running talks. Um, I'll be running talks in a slightly different way than you usually run talks. Uh, because I'll be giving it an explicit configuration file uh, that lets me um, show you how different configurations for docs will impact my code. Uh, so let's first start by actually seeing what's in the configuration file. So this is a pretty simple configuration file. All it's going to do is just run the unit test on my code using the PyTest test runner. Uh, it's among the most simplest uh, docs I and I I've ever written. But even that is useful. See, so it, it helps me, like it runs, it understands that if I call environment Py 3.6, uh, it needs to um, create me a Python 3.6 uh, virtual env. Ooh, I think I might need Wi Fi. Whew, exciting. Um, Casey, do you know how to set up the Wi Fi here? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Exciting, right, guys? So, Nick. Uh, yeah, I should have said The name of the laptop's MacGyver. You should just use a paperclip. <laughs> where's my, where's my, oh. okay. Oh, yeah, and uh, as you can see, tried to install the dependencies and didn't manage to. Now what I need to do is just find my mouse. Here we go, here's mouse. Uh, and Wi-Fi not connected. Select network. Okay, box visitor I'm assuming? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh. Okay. And I'll let you type the secret password, which will let you. Yeah, so uh, among other things, docs will download your dependencies from the internet. That's irrelevant. <laughs> uh, okay. But hopefully, yeah. Look, look. OK, so let's, let's try this again. Yeah, see, it's uh, Now you know it's live. not scripted. Totally live, <laughs> right, as you can see. Um, so yes, let's run it again. And it will recreate my environment. Uh, and like, it tried to install PyTest, because I told it I need PyTest. This is really important. And it found a problem. Uh, one apparently is not equal to two. That's a problem. My function is called useful return one. It should usefully return one. See, like I told you the code is going to be hella useful. Um, let's look at the code. Woo. That's a lot of work to return one, but. Let's just fix the immediate issue. And we run it. And it already made my code better. Not more useful, but better. Um, OK, so now let's uh, uh, try like a slightly uh, bigger thing. Um, so let's try running against PyPy. So sometimes there's like slight compatibility errors. PyPy is pretty compatible. Actually, I had to work hard to find incompatibility for this talk. Uh, and then other people suggested other ones, but they were more complicated, so I had to stick with this one. Um, so it will again run it for Python 3.6, and now it's creating a Python PyPy 3.5 environment. 
And, uh, oh, I checked the size of int. Why would you ever try to check the size of int? That is like very silly. Uh, that is not useful, so let's remove that. Here, this is how easy it is to make your code compatible with PyPy. Just remove the useless stuff. <laughs> and, woohoo! Yeah, so far it's working well. Um, so that's good, right? Like, um, good code, high quality. No, no more like weird uh, checking for uh, stuff. Now I'll do what uh, apparently Roy has uh, advised us against. And I will use Flake 8. Uh, just because I need to fix all the errors and I don't want to spend all day here, so I will just have like uh, uh, Flake 8 see what it can find. So it's still running the test, and oh, ah, so I have a missing import. I have uh, not a, like unused import because I did not need it anymore now that I'm not checking the size of int, and I have. Uh, uh, too few blank lines. That's easy to fix. There's a blank line here. Move this guy. Let's see. So, Oop. excellent. So let's see. It's, 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 uh, um, uh, now let's see uh, what else can we do to improve the code. Oh, right. Um, we want to measure the coverage, right? Like, we have unit tests, but like, what if we have code that is not unit tested? Um, so let's improve the coverage. Ah, uh, it's missing a line. What line is missing? Line 7 in useful PY. Let's see what's that about. Yeah, line seven, not covered. Let's go write a unit test. Yeah, that's my useful code. Um, so, uh, I'm add another one. Bah. And we we'll call it test two. And we'll check that when you return two, you get two. Useful code. Let's see what it says now. And as is often the case in uncovered code, we've uncovered the bug. See what I did there? Uh, oh, tough crowd. <laughs> so, um, ah, return two also has a bug, I see. Yes, it's returning one. Since we return two. Useful code. And Ah, uh, all green. Up. Oh, see? Ah, uh, ha, ha, indentation contains tabs. Oh, really live coding here. Uh, I did not actually do, do it in purpose, but see, it's actually finding problems in my code that I, none of you yelled out, right? Robots do it better. <laughs> uh, no, that's not, huh. Where am I missing a space? Where, where do I have tabs? Oh, ah, so um, let's, uh, uh, another one nice thing about it that we can only run the environment we care about if we need. So let's run the flake 8 and see. Uh, line 13, indentation is about a multiple of four. Oh dear Lord. <laughs> ah, indeed, indeed. How did it even work? Oh, excellent. So now let's run all the environments. Okay, so I, I can actually fix bugs in code. That's, that's uh, good to know. Um, anyway, um, but Tox is what helped me did it, right? So uh, Tox is basically your kind of, uh, um, uh, um, what's the Swiss Army knife for like all your running tests. It will remember which arguments to run it, which Python version to run it, especially good if you're moving from Python 2.7 to Python 3.6, uh, 
or if you want to make sure that you keep compatibility with PyPy, it can install multiple versions of the libraries so that you can make sure that uh, you're compatible with all the versions of libraries that you say you're compatible with. It can run Flake8 and PyLint and a bunch of other linters so that you can run all the linters and find all the problems in your code. Um, and yeah, that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you, guys. Um, so if anyone has any questions. I have a question. You have a question. Uh, why is it called Tox? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like an acronym, test something, something. I have a real question, though. Okay. Uh, basically, how do you manage the boundary between something like Travis CI and Tox? Do you have Travis run your Tox, ah, or do you do something else? That's an excellent question. Someone might think I, I, you know, I know you from somewhere. Uh, ta, ta, ta. So usually what they do is, um, as you can see uh, earlier, I, you can run it with a specific environment. So usually what they do is they have a uh, Travis run one environment per kind of parallel line, and then you run all the environments at the same time. Uh, it sucks up Travis resources, but it's good for me, so yay. Um, that's, that's usually what they do. Sometimes, if I'm really in the mood, I'll add another uh, uh, special Travis Tox test. The test that like, it matches exactly, that I don't forget any environments for my Tox file. Um, Tox has something really useful for that uh, called minus L. There we go, L. Uh, it will list all your environments, so you can make sure that your Travis configuration and your Tox configuration have not diverged. You can even make a test for it automatically on Travis. I am crazy and I do that. Very good. He's thought of everything. Um, I've been using Tox for, like, I guess, a while. Uh, any other questions from people who don't work with me and see all my Tox configurations? <laughs> Call me. OK. Um, Awesome, cool, thank you guys. So that's actually our third talk. And uh, last talk, unless there are any last minute an like announcements from the crowd, questions, comments, etc. Was there one? No, that was indicating the bathroom. Uh, All right, so in that case, Moshe, you usually close out these things, I, I, and you I, I, already I, have a mic, so yeah, I'm just I'm pointing for go. effect. Uh, awesome. <laughs> Right, so uh, several things. Um, first, we're still working on finalizing our plans for July. Hopefully, we'll get together um, something like uh, SF Python's project night, where instead of giving talks, uh, there'll be uh, a lot of small tutorials and people will bring their own projects. Um, hopefully, that's intended to be a bit more newbie friendly, uh, so because people can come ask questions directly and they don't want to hear something that might be too advanced for them. Um, so if you know any new Python programmers, that's definitely uh, what we hope uh, to get. Uh, please bring them along with you. Um, we are always looking for more companies in the peninsula to host. Our boundaries are kind of uh, Menlo Park to the south, uh, Daly City to the north, and I guess we don't really, and, and like the sea and the ocean. <laughs> Um, like we are. Uh, Moshe, Moshe you're, you're, like, you're like a rolling stone. There's no moss anywhere on this meetup. We're constantly rolling from yeah. venue to um, venue. So if your company uh, wishes to host, uh, please talk to uh, me, uh, to Mahmoud, or to uh, Mark, who's raising his hand very nicely. Um, come talk to either of us or send us a message on the meetup page. It is. Uh, White is quite possibly the worst messenger known to men, but we will go through the trouble of reading that if you send us a message there uh, telling us that you're interested in uh, hosting. And as well, we're always uh, interested in uh, speakers. If you have something to say, I feel like a 15-minute talk is much easier to get into. So this, if, if you have never spoken before, um, you probably have something interesting you can say in 15 minutes about whatever you're interested in uh, right now. Uh, right now, I'm writing a lot of toxes, which is why I was interested in that. Um, and, and we do record them to the best of our like abilities. So if you are looking to uh, submit a talk to another conference, oftentimes they ask for recordings of other talks. It's a good way to get started. Yeah. Um, so yeah, do, uh, do come talk to us. Um, one last thing I always like to 
close with, just as a reminder. Um, everybody's here is great. Uh, but we, um, if you saw in our meetup page, we do have a code of conduct. It is like almost a verbatim copy of the, PS, uh, the uh, Python uh, PyCon, uh, code of conduct. Um, you know, just be uh, decent to each other is like the really bottom line. Be respectful and professional uh, to each other. We want to be welcoming to everybody. Um, that's it. That's like all I have to say about that. All right. I have, I have one weird request since we have such a nice space and we have such a nice crowd. If anyone would like to be in a group photo for the top of our Twitter page and other similar banner type applications, our website, uh, despite Moshe's best efforts, is very lacking in media of that sort. So I would like to take a picture while the lighting is nice. Um, but uh, yeah, that's my one, one weird tip, one weird request. Is there anything else, Moshe? I think I would. I think so. We have the space for at least another hour, I think, right? And uh, Shopkick, which is right next door, for those who've made it to all the uh, like other ones, has invited us over for game nights. They would, you know, if you feel like playing a game, uh, and or if you want a ride down to San Jose, where I'm going after game night, feel free. Uh, <laughs> I don't have room for everyone, but like you know, feel free to come over. First come, first served. We have snacks and refreshments if you didn't have enough here. Uh, so yeah, um, group photo, game night, looking for places for project night and other meetups, and, and speakers. And speakers, always looking for speakers. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that um, that pretty much rounds us out. So a successful uh, Peninsula number four all round, I think. Uh, yeah, thank you all again. Thank you all.